summer of 1941 saw the RAF take the war to Hitler as British fighters and bombers swept into German-occupied territory in northwestern Europe. These operations, meant to taunt the Luftwaffe fighters into combat, would also bring two legends of the air face to face, German ace Adolf Galland and British hero Douglas Bader. Galland had made a name for himself in the Battle of Britain, taking the prize for most victories. Bader, with two artificial legs, had overcome great obstacles just to fly in the RAF. He proved all of his doubters wrong, notching some 20 kills and inspiring his squadrons to push the Luftwaffe out of Britain. On August 9, 1941, Wing Commander Bader charged into France on an offensive sweep. But at this mission's end, the British legend would find himself a prisoner in Gallant's very court. World War II would ultimately unite the legendary aviators Bader and Gallant, but their paths to that fateful encounter would share many striking parallels. In 1923, Douglas Bader's flying career was inspired by a teenage visit to RAF Cranwell, where his uncle was first adjutant. After sitting in the seat of an Avro 504 biplane and joining in student games, he was determined to become a Cranwell cadet himself. This determination, which would become a hallmark of his personality, would help him earn a placement at Cranwell five years later, in 1928. He turned up at Cranwell totally inspired by the tales of Cyril Burge, his uncle, who, who was the adjutant at Cranwell, who'd flown in the First World War, totally captivated by everything to do with aviation, flying, flight and sport, because he was a great sportsman. So for him, going to Cranwell was just a fantastic place to be. Around the same time, Adolf Gallen's flying career was launched as he took up glider flying at an air sports club at Borkenberg. Gliders were still allowed under the Treaty of Versailles and were a means for young German pilots to gain experience and for Germany to plant the seeds of her war machine. He was inspired as a, as a, as a youngster flying gliders which, which again, you know, is what the Germans did to encourage an interest in aviation amongst the young and give them some air experience. Uh, he became a pilot with Lufthansa and then, uh, you know, was absorbed into the Luftwaffe when the, the sort of covers were taken off to a disbelieving world in 1934 after Hitler came to power. Meanwhile, back in Britain, Bader had graduated from Cranwell and was honing his exceptional flying skills as a member of the RAF aerobatic team. Aerobatics was part of the standard uh, curriculum of uh, a Royal Air Force pilot. He proved to be good at it. He was made a member of the Royal Air Force aerobatic team. He did everything brilliantly but very low, said Tubby Mermigan, who was a Cranwell contemporary of his. Um, and he was, uh, he was a gifted aerobatic pilot, but he pushed the envelope too far. In December 1931, uh, he took up a fighter aircraft and performed unauthorized aerobatics at too low a level and crashed. It's said that he was responding to a dare when he did this. But in any case, he crashed. He uh, very nearly died, but he did lose both legs, one above the knee, one below the knee. This was entirely, entirely attributable to his own stupidity. Uh, and indeed, as he later commented, just made a balls of it, old boy. After a long convalescence, Bader willed himself to walk again on two tin artificial legs. Still the sportsman, he even pushed himself to learn to play golf. But this wasn't enough for Bader. He wanted to return to the air and to active duty. Having become a double amputee, Bader's entire life was dedicated to proving the proposition that I am not a cripple. Um, I, it, if he is remembered for anything nowadays, it is for that iron determination and the inspiration that he provided to, to others. I don't think it ever occurred to Douglas Bader that he was never going to fly again after this accident. And um, he set his stall out right from the outset to overcome this disability to get back into the cockpit of an aeroplane. His passion was flying. Um, 
to the exclusion of just about everything else really at the time. He took a flying test, which he passed, but unfortunately was still invalided out of the service because there was nothing in King's regulations to cater for disabled pilots. So that was the end of that. Adolf Gallen too had suffered a near career-ending crash during a training mission in October of 1934. He was in a coma for three days and sustained an eye injury which should have grounded him permanently. Pulling strings and memorizing an eye chart, he was able to remain in the Luftwaffe. Two years later, he was tearing up the sky in the Spanish Civil War. Galland, surprisingly enough perhaps, flew ground attack sorties. He flew Heinkel 51 biplanes in a tactical role, flying in support of the army, which is very interesting seeing as he ended up being such a, such a fantastic fighter pilot. The Spanish Civil War was a testing ground for the German war machine, which had its sights set on Europe. 1939 saw the Germans apply the tactics they had mastered as they stormed across Europe in blitzkrieg fashion, igniting World War II. With the declaration of war, Douglas Bader's flying experience was suddenly a much sought after commodity by the RAF. Well really, the thing that put Douglas Bader back into the cockpit of a Royal Air Force fighter was the Second World War. and. Uh, Bader, I, I, I imagine, was one of the very few people in the world who prayed for war because it was his salvation. Fortuitously for him, he uh, also runs into one of his former Cranwell buddies uh, who insists that uh, Bader be permitted to take a flying test. Unfortunately for Bader, his test flight aircraft was a Harvard, an American aircraft with foot-operated brakes. Luckily for the legless pilot, an old Cranwell schoolmate would team up with him during the flight. The initial flights that he that, that he, he undertook uh, were with Rupert Lee, Lucky Lee, who had been uh, a much junior cadet to Bader at Cranwell, and indeed had described him as a god. Uh, and Lucky Lee took his flight test and tapped the foot pedals for him. So although his flying was absolutely fantastic, you know, in the Harvard American aircraft, you know, he wouldn't have been able to stop him. Accepted back into the RAF, Bader's initiation as a fighter pilot took place at Dunkirk, shielding British troops as they evacuated from France. It was here that he tasted victory for the first time, downing an ME-109 on June 1st of 1940. Still a fledgling fighter pilot, Bader quickly rose up the ranks and found himself promoted to squadron leader of the 242, an all-Canadian outfit. Number 242 Squadron was formed in October 1939 specifically to be a Canadian squadron in the sense that it was composed of Canadians who had already crossed the Atlantic and enlisted in the Royal Air Force. When Bader arrived, the squadron was much demoralized having experienced heavy losses and having been forced to evacuate from France soon after their initial arrival. Bader's blazing personality may have been just the medicine they needed. Bader is a man in his early 30s, he's uh, experience of life and he is an amazing character, you know. If you, if you want to inject some morale into these kind of lacklustre, down-on-the-heel chaps, you know, this is the guy to do it. According to Reach for the Sky, the novel and film which forever immortalised Bader, the Canadians had doubts about their new leader. If we take the word of Paul Brickhill, the squadron was very skeptical. Uh, but they were skeptical of any British officer. The initial reaction was, you know, a pilot without legs, you know, what's that all about? And, and, and the Canadians, who are already as fed up enough as it is, uh, they suddenly think they've got a passenger to deal with, you know. Bader demonstrated his flying prowess with an incredible one hour and ten minute long aerobatic display for his squadron. This, combined with his dogged efforts to re-equip and repair their hurricane fleet, ultimately won over the pilots of the 242. On July the 10th, just one day after Bader's 242s were declared fully operational, the Battle of Britain commenced. Here, Galland wrote his name in aviation history, earning an unrivaled 33 victories. His wing, the JG-26, had underperformed under the stewardship of its elder commanders, locked into a World War I-style strategy. Goering understood that this was wrong, and he has changed this. 
So Mölders and myself, we were the first younger wing commanders of the younger generation. Goering guessed right that younger leaders like Galland and Mölders would be able to instill new tactics and techniques into their squads, enabling them to succeed in modern warfare. Galland demonstrated his leadership by taking control of the JG-26 and moulding it into one of Germany's finest. Bader, on the other hand, was initially out of the action, as his squadron, stationed at Coltishall, was part of the 12 Group, defending the North and Midlands, far away from the brunt of the fighting in the southeast, defended by 11 Group. Of course, Bader's kicking his heels around Coltishall, um, really absolutely fuming and seething that 242 Squadron is not getting a slice of the action while 11 Group's pilots, you know, are up against it every day. It wasn't until August the 30th, when a formation of over 300 German aircraft swept into the south, that the 242 Squadron was called in as reinforcement. With a height advantage, they swept down on the enemy and seemed to deal a great blow to the Luftwaffe. In the confusion of battle, the 242s overclaimed their success. Bader's um, claims subsequently were, were, were completely inflated. Uh, and this is because the, the, the squadron was actually on its first engagement of a large enemy formation. They hadn't seen anything like it before. Bader wrote a report to say that had he more fighters in the air that day, then more damage would have been executed on the enemy. The perceived success of their attack would inspire Bada and the 12 Group leadership to champion a strategy known as the Big Wing. The Big Wing was a proposal to assemble anywhere from three to five squadrons, which would be upwards of 60 aircraft, concentrate them in one big force to sweep down on German formations and decimate said German formations. The reality of it is it couldn't possibly work. You've only got to do some simple calculations, time over distance with a calculator, to see that it couldn't work. You couldn't scramble from Duxford and intercept a raid coming in on London because it would be, it'll be longer by the time you get there. The big wing was too slow, too cumbersome, too difficult to operate when you're trying to operate uh, Spitfires and Hurricanes in the same formation. It was an ineffective strategy. One could argue that, well, you have to try it at least once or twice. Uh, but it must be admitted that after the experiment, it was a failed experiment. As a defensive strategy, the Big Wing made no sense. Though the Big Wing proved to be a dubious defensive strategy, its mere presence may have helped win the psychological war against Germany's air crews. On a positive note, one thing it did do on September the 15th, on Battle of Britain Day, was the German crews had been told that Fighter Command was down to its last handful of Spitfires and Hurricanes, which was certainly not their experience even of being intercepted by 11 Group that day, when suddenly Bader appears in view at the head of five squadrons. The psychological effect that must have had on the German bomber crews cannot be underestimated. The RAF's adoption of the Big Wing would lead to the reorganization of all squadrons into wings. Bader, who proved himself an able leader, resurrecting the 242 squadron from the ashes, would see himself promoted to wing commander of the Tangmere Wing. He was due for a promotion. He had proved that he was a competent squadron commander. Uh, and the, the wing at Tangmere was one of several that were designated for offensive operations, what they called leaning forward into France, which was in effect uh, taking a few bombers over to France uh, as bait for German fighters and surrounding these, these few bombers with anywhere up to 300 fighter aircraft and hope that the Germans would come up and play and get shot down in droves. Didn't work out that way, but that was the idea. Unfortunately, um, we lost by, by a ratio of two to one the day fighter battles in 1941, which made the Germans term it the nonsense offensive. And the, the irony of it is that we lost so many experienced pilots and leaders, and one of them was Douglas Bader. 
In the early 1990s, Adolf Galland sat down with aviation artist Frank Wooden to discuss his recollections of the summer of 1941 and the chain of events leading to Bader's capture. Yes. At this time, the Royal Air Force was asked by the Russians to uh, show something and to uh, fight against the German Luftwaffe. The Russians did have, in the beginning of, of the Russian campaign, terrible losses on their air force. And therefore they wanted uh, that the Royal Air Force should help them. And therefore the Royal Air Force did incursions daily, one or two, with uh, one squadron of bombers. These were, were Blenheims at the time escorted by Spitfires, sometimes also some hurricanes. On the morning of August the 9th, 1941, Bader and his Tangmere wing received orders to take part in another routine incursion into France. However, the mission would devolve into a comedy of errors. So, on this particular circus, the bombers failed to, to find the target, ultimately dropped most of their bombs into the sea, uh, the Germans lose two aircraft in combat. Uh, the British lose five or six. These are not good mathematics. Crossing over the channel into French territory, the 610 and 616 squadrons found themselves overpowered three to one by a force of 72 enemy fighters, including Adolf Galland. Though other pilots in the wing had spotted ME-109s, Bader postponed the attack. Bader did not authorize an attack until he could personally see them. And then he went down. There were those who argued that Bader was trying to pad his score. Be that as it may, uh, it, it was not a good example of good tactical leadership. A furious battle commenced over the skies of France the vastly outnumbered British pilots fighting for their lives. In the maelstrom of bullets and planes, Bader soon found himself alone in front of a line of six ME-109s. Breaking protocol, he charged at one of the fighters by himself. What happened next has been the subject of intense debate. Bader somehow lost his Spitfire's tail and full control of his aeroplane. One of his tin legs was jammed in the controls, trapping him in the doomed aircraft. Luckily for Bader, the strap of his artificial leg parted, allowing him to escape from his Spitfire and parachute to safety. But what exactly brought the British hero's plane down? Douglas believed he was uh, hit by another aircraft, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you tell us that he was shot down. <laughs> Is that true? It is difficult sometimes when you are in a, in a fight, in a battle, fighter against fighter, to decide if you have a mid-air collision or if you got shot down. The feeling is about the same. Yes, yes I understand. Uh, when Bada was with me on the same, or some days later, he did not mention here he had a mid-air collision. Yeah. He wanted to see the German fighter pilot who had shot him down. I see, <laughs> yes. And who was that man? We didn't know this exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I have done it. I shot down two Spitfires yes. in this mission. In recent years, a third theory for Bader's downing has emerged. In 1945, Bader's squadron mate, Buck Casson, wrote a letter which casts doubt on Gallen's and Bader's explanations of the event. In 1987, Buck gave me a copy of a letter that he'd written to Douglas Bader in 1945 upon repatriation, when Bader had simply asked him, you know, what, what had happened to him on that fateful day. And Buck had written down his experiences. And Buck describes in this letter how he has attacked an aircraft, shot its tail off, at 14,000 feet and was watched the pilot trapped in the aircraft and not bail out until about 8,000. Well, Bardas was the only aircraft down, only Spitfire down, the only other aircraft down in that engagement was Albrecht Schlager, who was a 109 pilot, 
Um, and through a process of elimination, it was discovered later that the uh, um, at the crash site of his 109, uh, the tail wheel was, was there. So it certainly hadn't shot down Schlager. So there was no question that he shot down Douglas Bader. If it is certain Casson shot down Bader, the question remains, how could he have made such a tragic mistake? In the stress of high-speed combat, when you're pumped up on adrenaline, you're maneuvering at high speed, and you're basically coming in from behind an airplane. You don't get a good look at the, the markings, you don't get a good look at the, the shape of the nose, you're coming in behind it. There are many, many instances of mistaken identity. Interestingly, uh, the Germans on that day were operating the newish ME 109F, which was very different to the 109E that had flown in the Battle of Britain. That was a very angular aeroplane with uh, a strutted tail. And the 109F was all curvaceous and elliptical wings, very similar to a Spitfire. So it would have been a very, very easy mistake to make. Whether downed by a collision, friendly fire, or even Adolf Gallant himself, Bader soon found himself in enemy-occupied territory and was quickly apprehended by German forces. While recuperating at hospital in Saint-Omer, the British legend would receive an unexpected invitation. How did he come to be at your airfield? I was told by one wing commander that we had the famous English fighter pilot in our hands. He was in hospital in Santa Maria, and uh, he told me, this is the English wing commander Barra with two wooden legs. Uh, he was shot down, and uh, you should see him. I have visited him, but you should see him as an extraordinary man. You cannot believe it, this man, full of energy. And uh, I said, yes, I will do so, of course. And uh, I didn't have any uh, permission, but I have told him to bring over my invitation to Bara and let me know when he was ready to, to be brought over by car to, to my place. This was a distance of about 30 kilometers. So one day I got the message, Bara is ready, and I did send him a big car and a good-looking German first lieutenant, tall man, blonde hair, blue eyes, <laughs> typical German. And it, he had my invitation and he came. Yes. I did send him a big car, my, my biggest car I had, an open car. So it was a nice reception already. Then he came and uh, it was quite an impression, this man. When, when he landed, was, he left one of his legs in his cockpit. And my mechanics did repair it. But uh, it was not completely done, was not just perfect, but he could work on it. But it did make a noise. Me, 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 me. And he walked. Yes. And uh, he heard his pipe. And then we started talking and we had tea together in my uh, wing headquarters. And I wanted to know how many victories he had. And he, he didn't yes. say, no, it's only a handful, and two, perhaps two hands. But uh, he didn't talk very much. And we didn't avoid to make the impression that he would be interrogated. And we didn't talk very much ourselves in English. But we had some translators who managed this. This, in fact, was a well-known, widely used practice of the Germans to simply gather intelligence information. You've got a pilot in your, uh, an allied pilot in your hands, you treat him chivalrously, you apply him with champagne, and you surround him with people who 
apparently our other air crew, but at least one of whom is an intelligence officer carefully taking down notes. So Butter was certainly not just being entertained, he was being surreptitiously debriefed by the Luftwaffe. I don't think intelligence gathering came into the, the experience, really. I mean, the Germans genuinely respected him um, and, uh, you know, wanted to meet him and, and wanted to, to have dinner with him. You know, why not? Whether or not gathering intelligence was the motive for extending an invitation to Bader, the British pilot would soon have a first-hand demonstration of a key piece of the Luftwaffe's arsenal. After the tea, I invited him to see uh, the place where we had uh, 109th parked. I had two planes in this uh, situation, in these days. I had always two because I did not want to miss one mission. I invited him. He showed him the, the plane from outside. We walked around it. I had my victory bars on the tail. And then I invited him to step in the plane. What he managed with his two wooden legs in an unbelievable form. It was difficult. Difficult, yes. But he could, he could manage this. What was the atmosphere when you were all standing around the aircraft with this pilot, English pilot, sitting in your aircraft? It was amazing. It was a very unique situation. Uh, having such a famous enemy who did fight up to the last 10 days against you, sitting in, the, in your own play, plane. And uh, I must assure you that there was no security any security method taken by us, it was absolutely unnecessary. Uh, a prisoner of war, a famous wing commander, two wooden legs, in a foreign enemy, uh, in an enemy plane. Although Gallant insists there was minimum security, a photograph in Paul Brickell's Reach for the Sky, captioned, officer holding a pistol, has led many to believe Bader was under armed guard. I can tell you there was no pistol, no arm around the whole place, except the armament in the plane. Yeah. But what, what it was, was I have invited a Colonel Hood, a fighter pilot from World War I, with one wooden leg, and he had his gloves in his hands, and he puts his hand on the side and had as the gloves in his hands. So if you have a lot of fantasy, and you could believe that this was an arm, but I can assure you, this were his gloves. In the breach of the sky, you know, it's as a German officer is covering him with his, with his Luger pistol or his machine pistol or something, it's nothing of the sort, it's actually his gloves. And you can clearly see, if you scrutinise the photo, that it's actually his leather gloves. He's just holding them as he's talking to him. If security was as lax as Gallant remembers, the question remains, couldn't Bader, a skilled fighter pilot, have made a quick escape in Gallant's ME 109? Did he uh, ask you about the controls? Yes, of course. I explained him everything. Yes? I explained him the flaps and uh, the prop and... Uh, when I had finished uh, one moment, he said, uh, could you please start the engine? <laughs> I said, what, start the engine? Yes, I want to make only a little flight around the place here. <laughs> only around this place. Yes. I said, no. This, I cannot permit this. Did that Be make you Because I would have to step in my second 109 and to follow you and to shoot you down again. <laughs> and I think we should avoid this nonsense. Yes. Well, this <clears throat> makes quite a good subject uh, for a painting, I think. Because it shows uh, two great men and uh, they're together on peaceful terms for the time being. 
And from these photographs, I think I'd like to discuss with you how we should show this. I like this view very much, but of course we leave out the telescope because that wasn't a great success. <laughs> and, uh, but on the other hand, I, that's a very good view too mm -hmm. because I could uh, use that and I could put Douglas here, full face, and you would be standing on the port wing. Yeah, but Douglas will be sitting down. It is uh, yes, in the below, below this high. Yes. Or you must show him when he is entering the plane. Yes, uh, just before he actually sat in. down, he'd be climbing in. Mm. Yes. This one, of course, is a very famous picture, but unfortunately, it uh, shows a back view of you here, <laughs> yeah. and we'd like to... Nobody knows me exactly from this that's side. That's right, we'd like to show a full face. Mm. So th that's what I'd do, I'd do a sketch from these and uh, make a composition. Galland had provided Bader with a royal reception, even showing him the workings of an ME-109, but the British pilot still had one more favour to ask of his host. When we were out, he said, uh, could you do me a favour? I said, yes, of course. Could you communicate to my fellows on the other side of the channel that I am safely in your hands and uh, they would please send me my spare legs I have in my sleeping room at home and another pipe, this pipe is broken and also some tobacco. I told him, yes, I will try to do it. I'll let you know how we can manage this. And on the same day, in the evening, I found Göring in Karinhal. And Göring immediately, really immediately said, yes, you can do this. We have done this in World War I several times. And I like this, you can do it. You must see uh, how you manage this. And, uh, but you have my permission. The question of whether they were trying to be chivalrous, uh, one could consider that. One could also consider the propaganda effects. Let's, be, let's face it, this idea of chivalry in the, in the air, 50% uh, uh, of it is horse poop. Because in fighter combat, what is the basic idea? The idea is to get to surprise the other guy, get behind him, and shoot him in the back. This is chivalrous. Now, once the guy has been shot down, is bailed out, he's safely in your hands, he isn't a threat anymore, you can be polite. You are about to tell us about the arrangement of getting his leg over. I told you already, we had in mind to make an arrangement about an, one open sector. Uh, no shooting in this sector. They should come in with a certain plane and uh, land on this little field. The RAF did consider Gallen's offer and possibly sending in a Lysander to deliver Barda's legs. But the idea was quickly vetoed by a more powerful voice. Had they provided safe passage for a Western Lysander to fly in, and Woody Wood all himself, Barda's great friend and boss controller down at Tangmere, um, you know, was going to fly in and, and they dropped the legs off. I mean, what a propaganda coup that would have been. And as Churchill rightly said when he immediately vetoed the, the, the scheme, you know, the RAF does not need free passage to fly over northwest France. On August the 19th, 1941, the RAF bomber crew sent a clear reply to the Germans rejecting Gallen's offer. In one of the daily attacks, one airfield in Santa Maria was bombed. And at the same time, the English had communicated that not only bombs, but also a wooden case with the spare legs of Bader. It was written on it, uh, spare legs for Wing Commander Bader and so on. We, we were a little bit disappointed about this way in which the English did uh, communicate with us, but uh, 
There's no question we would have made some photos also. Yes. But it's this occasion. And we would have used it for propaganda. And this was exactly what the English side wanted to avoid. So you didn't expect the bombs? We didn't expect the bombs, no, no. No, 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 especially not on our, on our field. <laughs> what did they drop first, the bombs or the leg? All together. Wasn't there a risk of the bombs blowing up the leg? <laughs> it could, could have happened, but it would be <laughs> uh, a real unusual case. Yeah. Douglas Bader did point out when he wrote the foreword to Adolf Galland's autobiography, The First and the Last, that Galland had described uh, the legs being tossed out with a few bombs over Santa Mare airfield, and that's not actually true. What happened was the legs were dropped, dropped over Santa Mare airfield by parachute whilst the beehive was en route to attack another target. So it wasn't actually like that. A day after the bomb drop delivery, though Galland had made good on all his promises to Barder, this didn't stop the British pilot from making an unmannerly escape from his hospital room, wearing his freshly delivered legs. Barder was finally brought back to the hospital, and two or three days later, he escaped from the hospital. He took the blankets from other prisoners, patients, in the hospital and did bound them together and went out the window from the second floor. And uh, the last uh, blanket got separated from the others and he fell down. He did not get very far because he uh, did some damage to his knee because one of the wooden legs did break again. Yes. And a French girl, French uh, cleaning girl, did bring him to a near farmhouse and he was, uh, was brought there and we didn't know where he was. He was gone. We didn't have the, the French girl, we didn't have Bada. And my situation was not very pleasant at this time because I had invited him, I had shown him many things, and uh, so where was he now? Uh, but the same day he was uh, discovered, was brought back to the hospital. Douglas Bader's capture brought his combat career to an abrupt close, and he would remain incarcerated till the war's end. He might not have been able to battle the Germans in his Spitfire, but he was constantly at war with his captors. He was one of the most vociferous of goon baiting, baiting uh, that is, abusing uh, uh, the guards, insulting the guards, insulting the, the, their officers. This was another way that he could carry on the war because he could, uh, he could be a thorn in their side as much as he possibly could, which he did at every occasion every occasion, um, and ultimately ended up in Colditz Castle. Gallant, like Bader, saw his combat career cut short. Three months after Bader's capture, Gallant succeeded Mulders as General of the Fighters. Forced into this largely bureaucratic position, the German ace was prohibited from flying combat missions. It wasn't until early 1945 that he took to the air again, in an ME-262 in a last-ditch effort to thwart the Allied bombing raids. The advancement of the Allied forces into Germany would bring about Bader's release from Colditz Castle in April of that year. As much as he longed to return to combat, his days as an ace were over. They were not going to send him to the Far East because, frankly, he would have had great difficulty in uh, tropical climates with the stumps of his legs. Um, but he did take up a position at the uh, Fighter Leaders School, as I recall, in Britain in July and August of 1945, where, in fact, they were interviewing and hosting a great many German pilots. And on that occasion, he met Galland again. I didn't have any contact with him anymore until 
I was in the uh, same situation, but on the other side from the channel. I was prisoner of war, and uh, one time I was I, I was in, in an interrogation camp, Camp 7 in Latimer. This was an English-American uh, interrogation camp, especially for pilots, for Air Force and for submarines also. So one day I was brought to South England. Uh, there was a meeting of English Royal Air Force officers. And uh, when we came to the gate, Bader was standing there. He had a bottle of whiskey in one hand and a big case of cigars in the other hand. While Bader was stationed at this interrogation camp, he also made quick friends with a German pilot who had overcome similar obstacles to remain in the Luftwaffe. There was a German pilot to whom uh, Bader was very solicitous, and that was Rudel, because Rudel was another, another amputee. When Rudel turned up at this particular base to be interviewed and debriefed, uh, Bader noted that he had a rather crude artificial limb and instructed his own doctor to prepare a proper artificial limb for Rudel. Bader's act of generosity was just the beginning for him. He would become a champion for all others who had suffered the loss of a limb. In the post-war period he was demobilized from the Royal Air Force, uh, so he returned to Shell Oil, but he thereafter became a patron of uh, virtually any, any charity that was uh, dealt with amputations, particularly veterans' charities and children's amputations' charities as an inspiration for people who had suffered. He was probably without peer. Being such a massively positive person, um, be, you know, he, he, he made it his business to seek out and, in, and personally inspire other people who found themselves in the unfortunate position he did where they were having limbs amputated. In the 1950s, the novel and film, Reach for the Sky, would propel Bader to the status of global celebrity and inspire people around the world with the remarkable tale of his life. In later years, he would also remain friends with his old jailer and fellow ace, Adolf Galland. The two would remain popular figures in the aviation lecture circuit. As a fighter pilot and air tactician, Statistically, Galland with over 400 missions and 100 victories against some of the stiffest competition of World War II has few peers. Bader's totals, though better than most, are meagre in comparison. Bader's military career was, of course, severely truncated by his accident and his incarceration. On the other hand, Galland's time as a fighter pilot was cut short by his promotion to General of the Fighters. His final tally of kills was 104, which were um, achieved on the Western Front. Had he gone to Russia, his score would have been infinitely greater, which is where the great scores were accumulated. As leaders, both men motivated their squadrons to reach their potential, though Galland was burdened with greater responsibilities, commanding the entire JG-26 and eventually becoming General of the Fighters. Bader might not have commanded as many men, but his insight was passed down through the ranks by a generation of squadron commanders. An interesting thing that a fair number of the people who served under him subsequently became uh, fairly inspirational squadron and wing commanders in their own right. Uh, Stan Turner was an example. A man called Dennis Crowley Milling was another. Uh, Johnny Johnson was yet another who went on Clearly, both Galland and Bader are legends in their own right. As great an ace and leader as Galland was, Bader had even fewer rivals when it comes to the raw determination and courage he showed just to return to the cockpit of an aircraft. Both men climbed to the stratosphere of legend, but each one took his own path. 